Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Still working? Great, wonderful. Um, thank you so much for inviting me um, to be part of this really important conference. Um, great to see so many people here this morning. Um, my name is Luciana. I'm an MP in Liverpool, um, and I'm also the Shadow Minister for Public Health, which we um, in opposition do a bit differently, and we include mental health within that. So I shadow both Norman Lamb, who does mental health, and I also shadow Jane Ellison, who's the shadow, uh, who's the minister, I should say, for, for public health. And um, we are very concerned about health inequalities and obviously mental health um, forms a part of that. So my job is to um, look at the whole range of, of all the different issues. Um, I work with Andy Burnham in the shadow health team. He knows that I'm here this morning and asked me to send you um, his best wishes. Um, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that society's attitudes towards mental illness have changed for the better. I think if I reflect over the last four and a half years since I entered Parliament, we've seen some very positive changes even during that time. And there's far greater awareness, there's more discussion in the media, and there's many more public figures, including MPs, that are willing to talk about their own mental health and a softening of some of the harsher attitudes towards mental illness. <coughs> We can see the impact of interventions by people um, from Stephen Fry uh, to my colleague John Woodcock MP, um, from Alistair Campbell to Frank Bruno, um, in being candid and open about their own experiences. And we can see the difference that campaigning has made, um, led by Time to Change, but also supported by many organisations, some of whom I know are in this room today. We can see a change in the language that ministers and politicians are using. Um, now the term parity of esteem between physical and mental health really is, I think, the buzz phrase of the moment. And we've talked about it um, during many sessions of health questions in Parliament and in, and in debates as well. But although we've come a long way, even in recent years, it's apparent to all that we still do have a long way to go before every instance of mental illness gets the appropriate treatment and everyone with a mental illness is treated with the same understanding and respect as a patient with cancer or a patient with a broken arm. I hear too many stories, um, either as a constituency MP or on the visits that I've done, where people with a mental illness have been treated with suspicion or hostility. There is widespread ignorance and prejudice, and where we've, where we've seen many um, attitudes within society towards a range of issues, including same-sex marriage, to race and culture, modernised over the decades, society's attitudes towards mental illness in some quarters is still often stuck in the dark ages. The leader of the Labour Party, Ed Miliband, um, we believe was the first leader of a, of a party to make a speech specifically about mental illness, and he did this back in 2012. In it, he said that mental illness is a taboo running across our society which infects both our culture and our politics. It's a taboo which not only blights the lives of millions, Mental health is a subject we all, whoever we are, still instinctively avoid. At home, in the workplace, in our communities, it tends to be brushed under the carpet. Teachers and our parents are unlikely to talk to us about mental illness when we are young, and we all fear the unknown. This, this taboo, this stigma, persists and remains one of the main barriers to equal treatment for people with mental illness. I think the answer lies in two approaches. The first is a greater focus on teaching about mental illness and mental health and positive and, and prevention in schools, awareness raising in workplaces, and more responsible reporting in the media. I can think of a few examples over the past few months where still, um, I think in the wake of the, the tragic death of, of Robin Williams, where unfortunately there are still too many media outlets that were very irresponsible in their reporting. Uh, the second is greater openness amongst public figures from all walks of life to discuss their mental health and be honest about the issues that they face. And without such honesty and transparency, people will continue to suffer in silence. And it was back in 2012 that colleagues of mine um, in the House of Lords um, worked, in fact, across the House to ensure that parity of esteem was actually written into law. And it is now um, in there in the 2012 Health and Social Care Act. But we know that we still have a long way to go. And, and I'm not here just to focus on, on, on the bad stuff, but I think it's just um, worth reminding ourselves the context in which um, mental health exists and operates at the moment. There are a lot of challenges, and I'd be remiss not to um, reflect upon them, um, whether it was the decision to cut um, funding to mental health trusts by 20% more than the rest of the NHS over the course of the past year. We saw the Royal College of Nurses report that came out just last week that showed that we'd seen a reduction of 3,300 nurses working um, 
um, in mental health, many of those the most experienced nurses. Um, we've seen a disparity of spend that CCGs allocate to mental health. I did an FOI of every CCG in the country, and the, the, the gulf between the two is quite staggering. It's everything and anything from 6% of a CCG's budget that they're allocating towards mental health up to 18%. And quite often it's those areas with the highest levels of, levels of need that are actually um, apportioning the lowest amount. I mean, my own area in Liverpool, my CCG spends around 10.5% of its budget on mental health and we have the sixth highest level of need. But of course, it's not just what's in the pot um, and how it's apportioned, it's also the quality of services that are commissioned. And again, we see a big disparity across the country. And as a local MP in my own area, I hold my CCG to account on the quality and of the outcomes of my IAP service, where my constituents are wa waiting anything up to 28 days just to have a triage appointment on the phone. And then we'll then often wait months on ends to get access to treatment and because they can't necessarily have an appointment on a specific day in a specific place. So, there are more things I could say, but there are many challenges um, within mental health. Um, the Royal College of Psychiatrists has said that um, two-thirds of people with mental health problems don't get any treatment at all. And again, I, I use the analogy of a, a broken arm. If, if two out of three people that worked in, walked into A&E didn't, didn't get their broken arm fixed, we'd all have something to say about it. Um, I've had the opportunity to see many services across the country and I see some really um, in incredible work being done, sometimes under very challenging circumstances. Um, I meet the fantastic staff, doctors, nurses and support staff, and I've listened to the staff and service users. Um, and there's a particular challenge also, I think, at the moment where many services are being retended and lots of places and people are being asked to do a lot more and with less, and that's also challenging too. Um, I can reflect on perhaps the CAMS report we heard in, the, uh, in, the, in, in one of the previous presentations. Child and adolescent mental health services are also facing particular challenges. There was the Health um, Select Committee report, which f very much focused on issues around... Is this still working? Can you hear it? Sorry. Is it still working? No. In the meantime... Sure, does that one work? Yeah. Um, so I'm um, reflecting on the CAMS report, which also looked very much at prevention as well, um, and, and some of the challenges on, on that front and early intervention. Um, and something that I've picked up, um, again, something which is so important and has got very little attention, but thanks to the work of the Maternal Mental Health Alliance and the London School of Economics, who've done a study into perinatal mental health, you know, this is also an area that we really, really, really need to focus on. Um, I went to a mother and baby unit in South London, again, where they're doing really, really important work and supporting lots of mums and their babies, but we only have 17 of these units across the country, and I met mums in there that were travelling hundreds of miles to receive that inpatient care. Wonderful inpatient care, um, but um, they had been separated from their friends and family in the process of receiving that treatment. So um, that report showed that um, untreated perinatal mental illness is costing our economy £8.1 billion every single year. So um, I'm doing um, work as a constituency MP to hold my CCD to account about what we might be doing to help moms and babies in my area, but um, it's clear that this is one of the as well to focus on. Um, there was a report launched yesterday by the Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy, um, again, talking about parity with scheme for access to psychological um, therapies and how we make parity with scheme um, for access to those therapies a reality. Um, it touched on a few things, again, which we've heard already this morning around um, access to both, um, the um, black and minority ethnic communities as well as the particular challenge. Um, specifically in, in light of the 2011 census data, this is something we need to be doing a lot more work on. Um, it also talked about access to services for older people. I mean, again, we talk a lot about children and adults, as we should be, but actually there's a challenge for older people accessing those services too. And there's one more challenge, again, I'm not seeking to focus just all on that stuff, but it's important that we identify what the challenges are, um, is around choice, choice in mental health. We have other choice in our health service. We should be having choice um, in, in mental health. Um, it's now, um, a, it, should, it is now a legal right under the NHS constitution to choose um, the organisation um, that provides um, NHS care um, when someone's referred to their first outpatient um, appointment. 
Um, the guidance, the laws to come into effect as of, of April, and again, I just raised it because um, we know that um, how this is actually happening in the practice is, is, is patchy, but there's some, some really good examples, but we still um, got some areas where um, uh, patients and practitioners don't have enough information and resources to make this a reality. So I kind of, very quickly, I think, how to do what some of the challenges are. Um, and, but what's important is we look at what the solutions might be and what we should be doing. So there's, there's a couple of things that we've said as the organisation. Um, firstly, that we want to give mental health greater authority within the, in, with all the NHS, including um, rewriting the NHS constitution to create a legal right to talking therapies. And um, just as people currently have to drugs and treatment um, for physical illness, I say this also in the context of a report that came out um, from the Nuffield Trust, which showed that there's been over a 100% increase in people um, having um, pharmacological treatments for defense for depression um, since 1998. And so on, on that fact alone also, I think it's absolutely crucial um, that we do have um, a legal right to talk with therapies. Um, we also want to invest in having additional 20,000 nurses in our NHS, of which you know, a proportion of those will be um, within mental health. It's clear that we do need more funding for our NHS, so this is a big um, hot topic at the moment, a conversation we're having about how we might raise those funds, and we've committed to raising an additional two and a half billion pounds every year, um, and that will be funded, um, as we've heard again, um, lots of discussion around the mansion tax, and also by um, putting a levy on tobacco companies and to pay for that also. We're also very really keen to shift to a system which is around whole person care, which means that we don't treat um, physical health, mental health, and social care in separate boxes, but we actually bring it all together. Um, I can think of many examples um, where mental health has been treated differently um, or separately. I went to see a living unit not too long ago. I met a, um, a, a young woman in that living unit who received three months of inpatient care for her liver disease, which is, was as a result of drinking um, around a bottle of vodka a day. And when I asked what um, psychological support she was receiving alongside her medical treatment, she hadn't received any during that three months. Um, that is, I don't think, right. Um, that is a, um, a symptom of how we've all, how essentially we're treating one symptom at a time, and how we do need to move to a system which treats the whole person and brings together those three different elements. Um, we also want to get to a point where when people go to their GP, it would be as normal for them to expect questions about their mental health as well as their physical health, and for social and psychological support to be offered as routinely as medication. And there's already some GPs doing this really, really well. We want to make this the norm rather than the exception. And there are some um, people working in Rockledge and GPs on this um, particular issue. And we're really keen to work with them to make this a reality. Because, uh, again, I've met many people across the country who have to go to see their GP six or seven times before they actually get um, referrals to um, mental health treatment. And so our goal really is whole person care within one health and social care system. We've also got a task force that's about to report um, which is very much focused and looked on prevention, and again, that's obviously reflecting on the conversation presentation we had just before. That task force has looked at every single element within our society, and very much focusing on schools, as we've just heard before, and colleges and universities, looking at the workplace and the role of employers, and looking at communities too, and what all those different elements together can be doing to promote um, positive and uh, um, public mental health. Again, I can reflect on some great things that I've seen across the country where this is happening already, but again, we want to make this the normal rather than the exception. And I had an event at Bloomberg where I brought together some really big employers who really see the, the value in focusing on mental health for their employees. But again, they are the exception rather than the norm, and that's why we just do so much work in, in this area. Um, I hope that we can spend the next few months having a very serious debate about the future of both prevention and our mental health services. Um, we know the general election is on the 7th of May, um, but the starting gun has been fired. We're having lots of debates about lots of different topics at the moment. Um, tax, jobs, schools, immigration, economy, and the NHS. And I sincerely hope that mental health will continue to be part of the national conversation. And after so many decades in the, day, in the dark, we need to bring mental health into the daylight. And I'm um, looking forward to working with all of you in to make that a reality. Yeah,